Welcome back to Fish's Call Sheet, where we share the behind the scenes view of the entertainment industry and we celebrate the talented people who make production possible. These are the people who make what we do the incredible works of art. And today I have a really incredible special guest, John Simmons, director of photography, who you're an icon, Johnny. We, we've worked together briefly, but like you do everything. I've got so many things going on right now, not to brag, but um, I was doing an interview the other day because I have an art exhibit up. I have an exhibit up in East LA that's been getting a lot of publicity. The cat on the radio said, I don't know how to introduce you. You've been a professor, a mentor, you're a governor at the TV Academy, a, a vice president at the ASC. How do you want to be introduced? I was like, damn, it sounds like I do a lot of stuff when I feel like I don't do much of nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I get that. <laughs> you know, I guess what I'll start with really for people is, <laughs> what is your official job title usually? I'm a cinematographer. That's my official job title. I mean, if your job title is all about your day job, then I'm a cinematographer. <laughs> okay. And then what do people think a cinematographer does? I imagine a lot of people don't even know what a cinematographer does. <laughs> when I was first presented uh, the word cinematographer by one of my mentors, after him having seen my photographs and said, oh, you have the eye of a cinematographer. I had no idea what that, what that was. But a cinematographer's job is to basically interpret words on a page and bring them to visual life. You know, that's our job. Our job is to create images that push the narrative of a story. I suppose that's my job. Right, and then I, I joke I because that, those are the job titles, and then I always laugh because I go, okay, now what do you really do? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis on a set? What I really do on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis is this morning started with a production meeting with a script. And in that script are all the different things that are going to take place. Time of day, which I'm responsible for making a scene look like, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening conversations with the director and their intentions. And my head begins to spin as to how to lens that event or compose it. And I have conversations later on today with the art director and we talk about what her ideas are and how they relate to mine through the collaboration of a number of voices, including the network, the director, the writers, the showrunners. I'll eventually come up with ideas that hopefully uh, they'll agree with and feel like they're their own. No, just kidding. But, <laughs> but yeah, that's my gig. Okay, now. That's my day. Yeah, I want to go back to the very beginning, if we can, right? Yeah. So you started as a photographer, and you started early in your life as a photographer. Yeah, I started taking pictures in 1965. I had a mentor named Bobby Sangstack, whose family owned a newspaper called the Chicago Daily Defender. It's the oldest black publication in the country. It started in 1906. And I was very fortunate to have picked up a camera at that time because it was, you know, the civil rights era, there was a Vietnam War. There were a lot of very passionate events taking place. You know, people were, you know, at a, at a, at a nice emotional peak. And there was a lot of cultural events going on. There was art, there was music, there was poetry. I mean, it was a very cultural um, period. You know, a lot was being expressed through the arts and I really wanted to be a part of it. So I got to see a book called The Sweet Fly Paper of Life by Langston Hughes and Roy DiCarava. The photographs are a street life in New York and the narrative is a story of a day in the life of a family in Harlem, New York. And I saw those pictures and it was just something that I knew I could do. And Bobby, uh, my mentor I'd known since I was a little kid, his brother was a friend of mine. We went to kindergarten together. And Bobby took me under his wing and taught me photography. His generosity was amazing. That led to a scholarship to Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, where uh, Bobby had an artist in residence and I went down there as his assistant. And I was able to study painting and art there 
but a man named Carlton Moss, who's a director, a writer, a historian. Uh, he made films with Capra doing the Why We Fight series. Mm -hmm. And he made a film called The Negro Soldier about uh, black soldiers behind the enemy lines of World War II. And he used to come down to Nashville and do a class called The Image of the Black Man in American Cinema. So one day I showed him my photographs and he said that I had the eye of a cinematographer. I didn't know what a cinematographer was. I, didn't, I had no idea what that meant. Mm -hmm. And he sent me a subscription to American Cinematographer Magazine. And I found out what it was. Eventually he sent me a 16 millimeter Airflex S, some film that uh, Roz and Cal Bernstein, who owned a company called Dove Films that made commercials, uh, they made, it was, their partner in the company was Haskell Wexler. And those people became very significant in supporting my dreams of becoming a cinematographer. Long story short, I was able to put some work together and I got a scholarship to USC Film School. Once I graduated from there, I felt like I knew nothing at all. And I got a job as a camera technician at f and Seco. And I worked there for about two and a half years and I learned that nobody really knew much at all. Everybody was looking for answers to various problems in production and technical problems. I would have cinematographers ask me questions on the phone as uh, they were ordering equipment that I didn't have the answers to, but it made me feel comfortable, comfortable with the idea of not knowing, you know? And I'm still comfortable with the idea of not knowing. There's, there's no end to this learning in the craft of cinematography and art. I don't think that we ever arrive at a destination. We're continually evolving. And there's no state of equipment. It's continually changing and you know, evolving. And we as cinematographers and artists are doing the same thing. You know, we, we never come to a point where we say, oh, I got this. Isn't that the beauty though? The beauty is that our art is evolving and changing within our hands really. And we're part of that evolution. Yeah, it is. It is. And it's, um, you know, I don't want to say that it's a love hate relationship <laughs> because sometimes you would really like to be completely sure, but it's never like that. You know, I feel like there's a very interesting blend of the evolution of one's craft and the evolution of one as a person, you know, and the introspection that we do on ourselves as we evolve as people. You know, it kind of mirrors our growth as artists and technicians as well. I agree. You mentioned uh, Fisk University in Tennessee. That's one of the oldest historically black colleges in the country. Yes. And, and I know I've heard you talk about what a dynamic place that was and, and the involvement and the opportunity to kind of grow in that environment. We know USC, we know UCLA, which you've taught at. Those names people know, but a place like Fisk really kind of shaped your early creative endeavors. You know, it was such an environment um, to be there at that time. You know my photographs, and mm -hmm. I have a pretty extensive archive of photographs, and they were caught in a fire once, mm -hmm. and they've been being restored over the years, my negatives. And the other day, I discovered a negative, uh, a beautiful picture of Duke Ellington that I took. Yeah. And Fisk University just provided a platform for so many people to come and share. Duke Ellington, Miles Davis, Angela Davis, Stokely Carmichael, whoever was relevant during that period was there. One of my, there's a movie on TV right now on Netflix called Black Art and the Absence of Light. And the adhesive element of that film is an artist named David Driscoll. And he was my professor and an incredible influence in my life as an artist. He introduced me to a man named Aaron Douglas, who's the father of the Harlem Renaissance. And I helped him repaint a mural, which is one of the most valuable experiences of my life. 
is spending time with Aaron Douglas. And so many people were there that nurtured so many careers of people. It was an amazing experience to be in Nashville, Tennessee at Fisk at that time. And the reason why I brought up Duke first is because I had the opportunity to spend pretty much the entire day with him by myself after picking him up from the airport. And I thought about it and they told me to go pick him up. I picked up Duke Ellington in my Pinto, right? <laughs> in my Ford Pinto from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Stories that you only, because you've been there, like those are things that no one else can ever say. Like, and this is the magic of kind of what we do is you get these opportunities. I mean, you, you mentioned Cal and Ross. Those are two names that are, just synonymous with legendary production in this business, right? And, man, and unfortunately, man. people don't know them. Like people, we're losing bits. It's so interesting that we record history in a way through a camera, but we're losing bits and pieces of our history because people don't know. Oh my God, Michael. Scenes. They hired every cinema. They had, I worked as a camera PA there at a second camera system, but there was Vilmos Zygmunt. There was Jordan Cronenworth. There was Storaro. Sven Nyquist, if you named a cinematographer, they worked at Dove Films. Yeah. And I was so fortunate to be able to run and get them a sandwich and spend the day with them. But I gotta tell you what Duke Ellington told me. So I was with Duke and we were sitting there in the afternoon in this place. And he said, so what do you really wanna do? Well, by then I had heard about cinematography and I had my subscription and I knew that was one of my dreams. So I told Duke, I said, I want to be a cinematographer. He said, you know, I live in Malibu and I can see from my window surfers. And one thing that I've learned about watching those surfboard guys is they love sitting on the beach as much as they do riding the waves. So I think you're going to have to like take that attitude of a surfboard rider because you're going to be sitting on the beach a lot wanting to be a cinematographer. <laughs> he, he couldn't have been more correct. I spent a large part of my career <laughs> waiting for the phone to ring, you know? Well, you got to fight your way in. I mean, and, and this is one of the things for me, you know, um, my writing partner and I, we, we have built kind of stories and, and we're working on all these projects and so much of them is about inclusion and diversity. And at the time period when you came into this business, the word inclusion and the thought of diversity, unfortunately, was an afterthought at best, if, if that's even the nicest way to put it. I mean, it, it was almost the opposite of where you were facing opposition everywhere you went. Well, I don't even think it was an afterthought. I don't think it was anything that was considered. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was like an impossibility. Right. I mean, it was the same as the impossibility that faced civil, right, civil rights workers in the South. Right. Nobody could imagine that these people would possibly want to drink out the same water fountain, you know, or dream the same dreams of anyone else. When I first came to Hollywood, uh, I was totally an outsider. It was. Mm -hmm. The studio system was something that I couldn't even imagine mm -hmm. being a part of. As many times as I would drive into a lot uh, with a delivering something in a van to one of the productions that Dove might have been doing. And I get there and I don't see any people of color. Mm -hmm. I see a security guard, you know, a hundred yards away. We make eye contact and be like, yo man, I'm here too, right? And Right. It was just a very, um, it was just an environment that was not inclusive at all. And the racism was basically blatant. You know, my first experience on a grip truck uh, working with Dove Films was to get on there and see a grip, a grip box with the most derogatory cartoons of Black people and Mexicans and Asians. And I would have to sit on that grip truck and listen to jokes and they would say, hey Johnny, this don't include you, man, but I gotta tell this joke. It was this uh, in and uh, a Chinaman and so-and-so uh, uh, and, -and, -so. and <laughs> you won't like this one, but <laughs> Johnny, I'm sorry, I just gotta tell it, right? And that was the environment that I came up in in this business. What I did learn was I learned that those cinematographers 
that worked on those jobs had the power to be able to shape those crews in any way they wanted them to be shaped. And some of those cats were very embracive, uh, em embracing me and would share their knowledge and others would treat me like I was just there to pick up something. But I have to tell you, my man, Carlton Moss, the first time I walked into a, a grip truck at Dove Films, and obviously Cal and Roz Bernstein didn't know any of this was going on because these were people that um, wouldn't buy grapes when the farm workers went on strike. There were no grapes on the craft service table. And as soon as uh, styrofoam cups became environmentally unsafe, there were no more styrofoam cups. They were very conscious people. So they didn't know outside their building was parked with a grip truck with all this derogatory stuff in it, you know? And I couldn't throw those cats under the bus or anything like that. I, I didn't know, but I call my mentor, Carlton Moss, who uh, had gotten me the job with Dove. And I said, hey, Carlton, um, <clears throat> here's what I saw today when I worked, walked onto the truck. I think you uh, got me in the wrong place. He said, do you know any black people making movies? I said, no, I don't know any. He said, uh, do you want to be a cinematographer? I said, yeah, I want to be one. Click, he hung up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and that's the hard part, right? Like, so working with you uh, was one of the most diverse crews I've ever worked with. And I've watched crews over the years. You know, my writing partner and I, we started a, a charity, We Commend. We are trying to mentor young filmmakers and, and creatives and, and technicians because the access is the biggest problem. And you don't have skill to build a framework or to build, you know, a, a portfolio for people to see because you don't have access. And that's, we've hidden behind this excuse in this business of you hire who you know which always drives me crazy, right? Which is like, that's the lamest excuse I've ever heard. If that makes you feel comfortable at night, okay. Where I already had some awareness and was frustrated by the lack of inclusion in our business, because I grew up on a fairly diverse set, especially for the time period. And then working with you and, and other heads of departments who really do hire and bring in crews that look like the society that we live in, because that shouldn't be the goal. I don't know how we portray a world if the world we're working in doesn't look anything like the world we're portraying. It's foreign to my thinking, but it also is sadly indicative of how we've come far, but we have light years yet to go. Yeah, it takes, I mean, it'll be a while, man. As I told you the stories of all those things I confronted, mm -hmm. I decided that the day that I was able to make those decisions, my decisions, my crew would be very inclusive. And I always make it that way. You know, I mean, I've done it since the first time I ever put a crew together. And the crew has to be the kind of situation where any young person could walk into a room and see us working and see the possibility of a dream for them there. That's most important to me. But as I struggle with trying to make the industry more inclusive. One of the things that I'm involved in is the vision committee at the American Society of Cinematographers. And I share that with another cinematographer named Cynthia Pushak, who's also dedicated to that cause. I was thinking the other day, like you asked me, what was my day like, right. you know? So I'm gonna just paint a different kind of picture right now. A cinematographer sits at home and waits for a phone call for a job. And then he finally gets a phone call and begins to do an interview. And that's the first job of the cinematographer is to be able to navigate that interview. Mm -hmm. Then they look at the script and they begin to confront the technical challenges of that story. And that's the second job. Now they have to be able to deal with the idea of time, money, and all that as they take on that second job. 
Then the third job is to put together their crew. And what they set out to do is they set out to put together the most expedient crew that can execute those ideas in the shortest amount of time with the best quality. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not by nature an open humanitarian that doesn't see the world in a certain way, then your fourth job becomes trying to be inclusive. Right. So as I ask cinematographers to move in a more inclusive direction, if they've never done it before, I'm asking them to take on a fourth job. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Take on a fourth job, which may mean not hiring someone that they've used before, which is a cat that's going to get a job anyway. You right. know what I mean? Right. But they're going to bring on someone that may not have the same degree of experience, you know, not just the same degree of the experience, but being comfortable navigating themselves in that world. Right. So you're asking someone to do that. And I just realized that the other day because th this inclusion thing is moving really slowly. I mean, even with the mandates from the studios, um, there's a lot of resistance because, you know, the, the people feel like somebody's going to take their job from them. You know what I mean? Right. And inclusion is like a lot of things. It's like race, sexual orientation, uh, ageism. Ageism is a big one because, you know, these old cats, myself included, have a lot of experience to bring to a situation. But now when I was standing on the steps of Netflix uh, a few months ago and watched the crowd go in and out, I was like, damn, I'm the oldest dude. <laughs> I'm the oldest but, dude. And our I'm business dude. is very notorious for ageism because it's a very strange thing is because like you mentioned before, the technology changes so fast. It changes quick. But if this is your passion, like look at, look at all the different cameras you've used for photography and, and cinematography. Oh my God, yeah. Like, and this is the thing I think people forget about is your knowledge of past equipment allows you to do things with new equipment that new people never imagined. Like that's where we're losing. Oh yeah, we're losing that for sure. But more than that, Michael, is if you we're losing the contribution of all of us on so many levels. Yes. You know, I mean, I just feel like, I feel like it's just very important to broaden the fabric you know i think that all of us benefit by it you know Me too. it's like a writer's room that you know it's a a latin show or a black show and you open the door to the writer's room you don't see nobody black in there or mexican in there right how many times have i seen that well, me too <laughs> well and i always look and say okay regardless of what the characters look like on a show right yeah if you don't think that people across the board in our society have an experience of being in a family, right? Yeah. If they don't have the experience of being in a community, what's wrong with you? Like open up your mind and realize that you, if your writer's room doesn't look like the society that it's trying to write a show in, yeah. then you're missing a tone and a voice. And this is the other one for me, Johnny, is, and it drives me crazy. Like, don't give me one. One of any group, like no one person can describe the experience of a culture. Like stop trying to give me one person in the room. And then you, you pick on that poor person. You know, Randall um, Winston and I talked about this. It's like, oh, I love him. I, me too. And being the one guy in the room is heartbreaking because you only get asked certain questions and you're not being allowed to share the full scope of who you are as a human being. And exactly. that, you know, for my writing partner and I, Michael, we started We Commend as a charity to kind of help mentor people and bring people in and do community outreach. Our two production companies, are, are, are my one with my partner is inclusive, inclusive being in the name on purpose. And mine is mutually inclusive. Like for <laughs> me, this isn't, it isn't a buzzword. This is a way of life. And, you know, I know in an interview you did, you asked two questions and I'll give you the answer. It's one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to have you. You said, 
who's going to feel bad about the previous hiring practices and the lack of inclusivity? And then you said, who's going to be compelled to take that responsibility to change things? And the answer is you already have, and I am. I'm, I'm telling you right now, Johnny, that's part of the reason that I was so, like I've been bouncing around the house waiting to do this interview with you because we share this passion. And, and here's the thing. When you have a diverse crew, you get diverse perspectives. Exactly. And you right. don't offend people. What you do is you uplift everyone. And that's what it's got to be about. Yeah. It has to be. It's got to be about that. I don't understand. I don't understand why it isn't. I don't understand. Well, here, here's the deal, man. We're like trapped by history. We're trapped by biases. We're trapped by so many things. I mean, one of the things that I was digging on in terms of the pandemic mm -hmm. is the pandemic is a worldwide event. There's not a spot on the planet that hasn't been touched by this pandemic. And still people don't realize that we're all intertwined in this fabric. Right. called humanity. We still want to like have attitudes towards people about this and about that. And the bottom line is everything I do is connected to everyone. Right. You know, everything I do, it's the small, it's like the butterfly effect. You know, every little thought that manifests itself in the physical world eventually affects everybody. And I'm responsible Yes. I'm responsible for thinking the right way, thinking about uplifting, you know, and the underserved are the most important to uplift right now. It's just not fair. The Verna Myers, who is one of the diversity people at Netflix and her talks are on TED Talk. I don't know if you ever heard of her, mm -hmm. but she's amazing. She's uh, just incredible. And one of the quotes that I love from her is, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance, right? Yeah. So one of my electricians is hired by this cinematographer, a white dude, who is basically responding to the call of inclusivity through the studios. Right. He gets there. And he gets on the truck and the best boy starts playing some rap music that continually repeats the N word. Mm -hmm. And then the cat says to him, suppose I was to call you that, how would you feel? He said, well, if you call me that in this truck, I would just have to be quiet about it. If you call me that in the parking lot, maybe that'd be a different kind of response. He said, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go stand by the camera because this doesn't look like it will end well with me being in this truck. So he does that. That is the difference between diversity and inclusion. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So inclusivity involves the entire crew. It involves right. everyone understanding what I have to offer. What's my contribution, you know? And I know on my cruise, we might get confronted with a big set for a week, you know, with a bunch of stuff to do. Right. And we have to hire extra guys. So I talk to my guy for my key grip and I say, hey, what about that cat that we work with for one day, so-and-so, so-and-so? And my man will say, mm. He wasn't very good, man. He didn't know much. I said, well, hire that guy. I said, hire him so we can sharpen his skills. And they'll get all flustered and everything. And I would say, hey, man, we just have to pretend that somebody just fell off the ladder and we're one man down. Yep. Because if somebody fell off the ladder and we were one man down, we wouldn't, win. We wouldn't miss a beat. We'd keep on going, right? right? So as a cinematographer, that's how I feel about inclusivity. I feel that way. I have crew. I have everybody on my crew. I have people on my crew, not older than me, because I'm getting pretty damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. It, it, it's really interesting. You know, the inclusion and diversity also, like you said, whether it be orientation and gender and, and 
all of the categories, right? But that every, the more the tapestry looks like the society, the yes. more likely we are to produce great work that has good perspective. Yeah, man. And, and that's the thing. I mean, you're not making photography or films or pro like we're not making projects for one person. We're no. not making for one audience. We're making it for the world. And, you know, I'll tell you, man, you know, here's another thing, too. You know, a lot of my associates have worked on films in various capacities because I deal with everybody. You know, I mentor a lot of people and a lot of these people get PA jobs on movies and they're like, Johnny. They're doing a thing on uh, the subject is black. The cinematographer is white. His entire crew is white. I'm like, well, who's black? Who's mixed? What's the people of color? Well, we got a couple of PAs, hair and makeup. And that just makes no sense at all to me. But yeah, the that, people shaping the project that's, don't, don't have any experience in the thing that they're discussing or bringing to life. And no, exactly. You're going to yeah. offend people and you're going to make mistakes and you're going to miss something because yeah, it's, even it's if you're well intended, you just don't know. No, it's very offensive and it's no different than what it's always been. Right. And, you know, I just expect people to speak up and sometimes that's more difficult than not, you know, when you pay a price, that's the thing sometimes is it depends on who your bosses are. You know, your story about, you know, Carlton basically hanging up on you and like, look, you're just going to have to stick it out and make it work. Oh, yeah, man. One of my favorite things to say is that your passion has to be greater than your obstacles. Agreed. But we should be getting to a point now where you shouldn't have to fight to have a voice. You shouldn't have to have this issue where someone is judging you based on their preconceived notion of what you look like before you walk in the door on a set, because a set should be a place that inherently everyone blends in because this is about talent and skill and learning. It's not about, it's not about a category, right? Like, and, and yeah, it's bizarre. But I'll tell you, Michael, beliefs have to be flexible. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like Stevie Wonder says, What's true today is not true tomorrow in one of his songs. Yeah. Well, we have to be able to like recognize the fact that we continually have to be flexible with the new information we get. Agreed. Did all these people have to be killed before we realized that all the police weren't cool? You know, <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? It's like, I mean, some people still don't believe it. I mean, we have COVID deniers that still exist with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people dead and people still saying this is like, some false stuff, right? I mean, it's like, it takes a lot to get people to challenge their beliefs and to, right. and here's the thing that I don't agree with, is I know that intuition is a truth telling factor. You can't tell me that up on your first feeling about something and you say to yourself, oh, that ain't true. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. When you know that, you know, it is. And I just don't really understand how that works. I mean, history is, has shaped our culture. Right. And the habits of our past are hard to change. And the influence of our parents, the influence of our communities, all those things, you know, always have to be challenged. Do we have to challenge every, every belief that ever comes into our heads in order to move this thing forward? Um, man, we sure did take a turn off of cinematography, didn't we? But not really. No, no it's <laughs> great because it, it is, it's, it's about our business and what our goal is. Yeah. And one of the things is you and I share this passion is I like stories. I write stories that are from perspectives and often they're from perspectives that are not what the world considers to be I don't know, the term would be dominant perspective or historic perspective. The truth is I write stories about people who have good stories and good perspectives. And at the end of the day, most of them come from minority viewpoints because those are the people pushing and changing. Society does, has never changed from the top down. It always changes as you fight your way up through the system because you've seen where the system is lacking. Yeah. Right. And I think that's an important thing. And so for me, Telling diverse stories is really about telling real stories and telling the stories that maybe historically other people overlooked. But the reality is that's where a lot of the beauty and strength is. 
you know, the civil rights movement was about progressing everyone in society. It wasn't about any one group. And that's the thing is, it's not a problem in one community, whether it be representation, gender, orientation, or race. Those are society problems for us. And until we look at them that way, and until people like you and I, who get a chance to hire people say, no, we're going to do it a little different. We're going to take on that fourth job because we believe it's right and necessary. Right. That's where progress has to happen. And, and it's one of the things that I love because you meet resistance, but the resistance is minor in comparison to what the goal is. Right. But let me, you know, you brought up something really interesting. Um, the civil rights struggle, the initial stages of the civil, civil rights struggle. If you look at some of that historical footage mm -hmm. and listen to some of those historical commentators, even cats we admire like Walter Cronkite and dudes like that, right? Mm -hmm. And you hear how they refer to the civil rights people, the black people and the people that are sympathizing with them. And you pretty much get to see ideas that have shaped this country. But here's something else. I had to do a panel discussion with the Getty Museum about my photography and artwork. And it was about protest photography. And the night before I did it, I was a little bit anxious because I just didn't know exactly what I was going to say. But as I was sitting in my dining room, I was looking at a piece of work that I did and it had Harriet Tudman in there and she's surrounded by freed slaves. My father was 20 years older than my mother. He was born in 1902. So I did the math on Harriet Tutman's death. My father was a teenager at the time she died, which puts me one generation away from slavery with a different attitudes towards slavery than the people that the people in the photograph had escaped from. But some of their offspring were the same age as I am now. Do they feel the same way about that historical situation as I do? Or do they feel slightly the same way towards that historical situation as their grandparents and great grandparents did? Right. So some of the, what I'm saying is that some of those ideas are still present. Some of those influences and passions for history are still present. When I see a picture of Harriet Tubman and the slaves around her, I think, whoa, I'm one generation away from that. I'm one generation from some horrible stuff, right? Then I realized that I picked up a camera in 1965, the first year that black people were allowed to vote. So my whole childhood had been nurtured in a state of protest right. and in a state of awareness as to the struggles that my people have gone through. But it was only that moment that I realized that I was only one generation away from the event, which is damn near a current event. You know it, what I mean? It is. And it's, that's it's, crazy, it's, right? It's crazy. No, it, and that's the hard part is we have made progress. We have come a long way in, in some ways, but not far enough in others. And, and it's, it's crazy when you look at it that way. Like my dad's an immigrant. Oh, okay. And so I know exactly why he and my grandparents came to the United States and, and I'm so tied to the opportunity and they came here in 1960, right as the civil rights movement was really just ramping up, right? So yeah. he grew up with that and he grew up in Israel living through terrorism, right? Right. Contrast that with my mom, who's from a really small town in the middle of the mountains in Virginia, where, you know, there's, I don't know, same school for, you know, kindergarten all the way through high school and, and the community is so small and you're still part of the South. So some of the, the thought processes and, and the progression of history is very different. So growing up with that as a background and then coming into this business, right? Yeah. I, I guess that part of, you know, kind of, from, I, I never really looked at myself as an activist so much as, as <laughs> to me, it seems like 
basic knowledge and basic awareness of like yeah. being inclusive. But the reality is, as I'm getting older, I realize, no, you have to be a little bit of an activist in these things because there's people holding on to a form of history that doesn't really serve us anymore. And, and, and it's, it's not that far away. No. And it's a crime to remain silent. Exactly. I, I always taught my kids silence is acceptance. So if you're going to sit there and participate, you are participating. Yeah, exactly. Whether you want to be or not. It's like when people would say, I'm not political. (laughs) Everything everything you do is political. Your trip to the grocery store is political. Right. Everything. Everything Everything. you do. You're connecting. You're you're making decisions with your economics that are political all day, every day, whether you realize it or not. Every day. Every day. It's true. Now, going back towards cinematography, as we kind of bring this full circle, Johnny, what's the best part of your job? What's the part that lights you up after all these years? I, well, you know, I have to tell you this. I mean, the best part of my job is kind of selfish. And the best part of my job is that I love to make pictures. You know, I love, I love to look through that camera compose a frame, light something, make those images tell a story and push a narrative forward. And I'm like so fortunate too, because I get to do it even when I'm not there with my still camera. And then at night I paint. My whole life is about making pictures, you know? And the other thing I like is I like to be able to change the face of the industry at my job. My new job, the one I just got finished doing, Family Reunion, which has to be my most favorite sitcom I've ever worked on because the people there tell stories that are really funny and really socially relevant. I mean, I've never seen anybody pack together that information so well. Meg Deloche, who put that show together, I'm just in love with her. And... She has given so many people the first opportunity to do whatever it is. ADs that AD for the first time. She gave me my first directing debut in terms of TV recently. And she's given people opportunities that didn't do well. And when she had to replace them, she replaced them with somebody who'd never done it before again. I just love that. And our crew looks like the world we live in. Right. And I'm doing a show now, which is the reboot of iCarly, right? Michael, I looked on that crew the other day and I had to pull the producer over and I said, hey man, look at our crew. It looks exactly like when you get up in the morning and walk down the street and you see everybody present. Yeah. And I feel so good because I'm responsible for that and I'm responsible for sharing it with the producer who's also of the same heart. You know what I mean? I really get off on that, man. And I feel really good about going to work every day. And even this late in the game, I have the same amount of curiosity and enthusiasm that I've always had. I love being able to share with people. People talk about mentoring, you know? And that's a misused phrase. Because when I run into someone who Eventually, I hear them say, oh, yeah, Johnny is my mentor. A lot of these people call me Uncle Johnny, right, which cracks me up. I'll say, damn, mentor, huh? No, you know what it really is? It's about being in love with something and running into someone who has the same love. And because of that love you guys share, there's an immediate affinity. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to do when you do that? You want to push their dream forward because their love is pushing your dream for what they walk away saying, oh man, that's a cool mentor. I'm walking away saying, what a wonderful time we just had together. And I don't even realize that mentoring was what I was doing, you know? Yeah. So that's something else I enjoy, what people call mentoring. I love to run into somebody and feel that feeling, you know, of being able to share the same kind of passion. And You know, I just can't wait to get up in the morning to be able to do that again and have every morning be a new morning where new stuff is going to happen like that. 
I always joke with people is I want to be a really chronologically old kid at heart, <laughs> like, like through the years to love what we do. And, you know, in this business, I grew up here and I knew I loved it, but I kind of got pushed away from it and started listening to what other people wanted me to do. And then I was a dad young and I had to pay the bills and do all these things. And I worked my way back into this business because I've loved it and I love it from top to bottom. I love it every day, but you know, I worked at the shop, at the electrician shop to get back into this. I've, I've lugged Saco Cable up hills for movies and been on location. I've worked props and set dressing and all these things. So I guess my perspective, I think I'm really blessed in that way of being able to look at it. And I know what it's like to be the guy who has to get there at four o'clock and set everything up. Yeah, me too. I'm and I to love, you. I never forgot that. And you're one of those people who never forgot what that's like. Oh but also looks at every one of those people. I mean, you and I, we look at the PA who walks in and we think, I, I've seen you do it and I do it all the time too, is I ask that person, what's your dream? I want to know what, exactly. what brought you here. Right, exactly. It's important to know. Yeah, because I want to know. And is there a way I can help push that dream or, or get you knowledge or find you someone to mentor you if I don't have that skill? How do I help you make that next step? Because yeah, exactly. That's what we do. If we... If we keep all these things, in, and this goes back to a philosophy too, is if you hold all these things so tightly that you never share, you're the one who doesn't grow. Exactly. Here's what I tell my guys, you know, as we get confronted with things that are difficult or, you know, we have different directors all the time, you know, that might cause a little bit of a strain every now and then, or we get a gig and uh, the producers might not be that cool. And I, you just have to remind yourself and remind everyone else that every day is your first day at work. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you were at home hoping that the phone would ring and somebody said, yeah, you know, you start tomorrow and you hit that, you hit that door with all the enthusiasm in the world. You put on your best self to go at it. Yeah. That's how we have to go at it every day. We have to have every day be our first day at work. At least I feel like that. You know, I can't wait. As soon as we get finished, I'm going to get off this interview with you. I'm going to go get my COVID test real quick and walk into the stage as if it was my first day ever on Paramount's lot ever. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the thing. Every day is a new day. Like, that's one of the beautiful things about this. And yeah, it, yeah. like, don't lose the magic of what we get to do because that's what it's supposed to be. Make magic. Exactly. Share pictures and make them mean something. Exactly. My friend says, blow into your palms. If you can feel your breath, then you have the ability to do anything that day. <laughs> I love that. It makes me look forward to tomorrow. And, you know, it doesn't make me shy away from all the things that we have to confront that need to be changed. You know, that seems to be just a part of knowing what's fair and what's right and what's good for all of us, you know? All right, I have my final run of questions that I ask everybody. So if you'll, okay, cool. you entertain me, I got a few more. And, and All right. this has been awesome. Johnny, cool. it's fun it, talking it, to you. because you, you light me up, right? I'm going to get off this and I'm going to go write and all these projects like you, you have <laughs> visions jumping in my head. And I'm like, I, I need Johnny to mentor me. It's really what I'm saying, right? <laughs> well, all we right. are mentoring each other right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is the first thing you look for on a call sheet? The first thing, the call time. <laughs> <laughs> what time I do, right? Yeah, what time do I need to be there? And then I look at the list of things we have to do that day, which mm -hmm. I pretty much already know because we've already gone through it. And, you know, and that's when I began to get nervous as to whether or not we have the right equipment for it. And, you know, that's when I really began to feel like, uh-oh, it's my first day. <laughs> now what's the last thing you want to see on a call sheet the wrap time <laughs> that's me i'm like i don't want to go home i want to keep working and doing stuff and making stuff right like the, the yeah, last I thing i look see. at is what time we yeah, are I, like, I got stuff to do i want to see if anybody's taking that eighth of a page as seriously as it should be taken <laughs> agreed agreed yeah all right what's your favorite thing to see at craft services well, I'm basically a vegetarian, so 
I want to see some things that are healthy for me to eat, but now craft service, I would just love to be able to see craft service now with this COVID thing going on. Yeah. You know, the craft service guy is behind a tent and you're peeping through a little window, right. you know, like in a dangerous neighborhood when you want to. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me bits and pieces too now of like being in a, being in a dangerous neighborhood and go into like a taco truck or something where you, you peek in the window and you're not sure what's in and you can't see even really. And right, exactly. Kind of you just see a little day. slot, yeah. you know, so I'll be glad to see craft service, period, you know? Yeah. All right. Now, what do you hate to see at craft services? All of my crew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're the boss. That makes perfect sense to me. Because then you're always like, uh oh, we, we got stuff to do because there's always something to do. <laughs> That's a great answer. Okay. Johnny, how do you define success? I don't know, Michael. That's something I don't know. I mean, because people look at me as, being su successful in areas. And I look at, back at that stuff and I see a series of coincidences that have led to a certain point. Yeah. I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to define success. I mean, a certain kind of fluency with the materials that you've got to deal with is successful. But like I said earlier, you know, I feel like personally, I'm always in a state of becoming. So I don't ever feel that successful. And I learned a long time ago not to live my life on a comparative basis to others because there's nothing but sadness in comparing my life to what I think is the success of someone else. So I kind of shy away from looking outwardly and saying that person is successful or I need to acquire this to be like them. I don't think that comparative living is very helpful and a lot I, of people see success comparatively and i agree with that, do that. And, and that's the thing for me is normally i ask people you know how are you doing on your definition of success and the truth is i'm gonna flip it on this one a little bit johnny if, it, if you'll indulge me is yeah i love that you come every day to make every day unique and i love that you always see it as a state of learning and building. And I think that's where you're most valuable in, especially as a cinematographer, because your, your, your hand is in every piece of this production. You literally are controlling what the output of the appearance of the picture. And what we really make is a bunch of moving pictures, right? If we really yeah. set it down. And I see you as incredibly successful and so wise. And it, like I said, I, I've been looking forward to this opportunity but I love, because I share this too, and, and something I, I've learned a lot from listening to you and talking to you in the past is that it's not about what you've done or what you've achieved. I love that mindset is it's about growing each day. And it's not about what other people are doing on other sets or what other people did or who got what award. It's about, were you better than yesterday? Did you, did you pay attention to every eighth of a page, like you said? Yeah. And you know, our gig is like, so collaborative mm -hmm. it's like i've been nominated for emmys countless times and i've got a couple of emmys and i got an emmy and i took my key grip and my gaffer on the stage with me to receive it and the reason i did that was to make a statement that that emmy wasn't my emmy mm -hmm. you know it it was the pa's emmy because if they hadn't been there to move things out the way and help then it wouldn't have happened and, it's just everybody's award. That's one thing that doesn't get the credit is that we rest on the so shoulders of so many people in order right. to acquire what someone calls success. You know, I know that when I'm at work, everything I do is collaborative, you know, from the top down to the security guard to everybody is making that moment happen. When I take pictures with my still camera on the street, it's just me, nobody bothers me. That's my stuff, right. you know? When I'm painting, that's my stuff, you know? But in the movie business, it's so collaborative. Uh, I can't take credit for very much, except when I look through there and all the decisions have been made and they say, roll them, that's not me. 
that's everybody has made it so that I could make it happen yeah. and have agreed that this is how it's going to look. This is how we're going to tell this story. I like what you're doing. Or Johnny, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and that's how this came about is for me, John, I mean, we share this is it's an us. Everything is collaborative. And I've never been a guy, like you see me on camera, so my face is more present for a lot of people. But it doesn't mean my contribution is bigger or that I'm alone or this is my achievement. It means- No, not at all. You, you, you see me and I have the blessing of getting to be standing front and center for this experience and I get to share and I get to be a conduit for some of that. I know, it's so amazing. So but it's, it's an us, right? Like every award, every production, everything is an us. Everything is an us, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so now, <laughs> what's the one thing you want on every set? The next job. No, I don't know. <laughs> the next phone call, right? The next phone call. Yeah. I want that. I want that set to lead to the next set. A hundred percent. I'm with you, Johnny. That's the perfect <laughs> answer. That's me. I want to. I want to work so much. I have to say, I'll, I'll catch you on the next one because I'm still busy doing this. Right? Like I don't want. I don't. I don't like gaps. I like to work. I yeah. want to lead one to the other. And, and anybody who's ever had to hold their breath and wait for the phone call knows. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what's the one thing you would eliminate from any set? The lack of inclusivity. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. Okay. What is the best gift, Johnny, that you've ever gotten from working on a project? To be able to change someone's life is the best gift. Yeah. Is to be able to give someone the opportunity to be there and see their life change. And I've seen that a lot. I've seen that a lot. And that's the most important thing that has happened on the set. And also to be able to work on a project that has actually influenced someone, you know, or has made some difference to somebody. I guess that's what I really. Yeah, to, to the beauty of, and I've watched it happen. And I've watched people you hire start in one job and move to the next and, and move yeah. up the ladder and change their lives. I love that. And, and, love that. and it's everything, right? It's every time you hire people in this, in this field in production is it's an opportunity that could change their life. All right, Johnny. So how do you want those who work with you to remember you? I don't know. I just hope that a lot of these things that have been important to me, people digest and it becomes important to them. They just carry on the tradition. I just hope they don't have to intellectually remember me. I hope they remember me in their actions and in their hearts. Well, then I'm going to say one of my goals is that you look back and you say, I help influence Michael and I'm proud of the things he's done and achieved. And I'm proud of what his sets look like and the stories that he's telling. Because you gave me another goal. I, I dig that. I like that, my friend. Yeah. What is the legacy that you want your loved ones to take from your life? You know, I'm leaving a pretty big skid mark, you know? I've got lots of pictures, lots of paintings. The legacy that I'm leaving them is gonna be quite a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think it's, um, it's a beautiful apropos perspective of the world that you came into and how it changed along the way. I mean, you look at your photography just alone is getting ready to be featured in the Getty and all of these things. You've created pictures through the civil rights movement all the way up to modern protests. People will know a lot of your productions and they'll see some of those credits as they look through this and, and rediscover aspects of your career. But the legacy you've left is you're almost a witness that has carried history forward. If I dare say that. I guess so. You know, I'm really fortunate. I have a wonderful family. You know, I've got good kids that I love and have been supportive. A wife that has been supportive and previous relationships that have been supportive. 
you know, we've we've all helped each other a lot. And, you know, I'm glad, I'm very happy about what you said because I'm already proud of you and what you're doing. Um, and if I had anything at all to do with that, then I'm even happier, you know, and you just never know what running into somebody does, you know, and how it, its ramifications affect everyone else. And I just hope that uh, we continue to realize the connectedness of all of us and move all of us forward and, you know, make a difference. Well, let me tell you, it's been such a pleasure to have you on Fish's Call Sheet, to ask you all of these questions, to dive into so many different areas. It, it was a conversation that was as complex as your really detailed life in all of these other ranges and realms and, and titles. But at the core is this beautiful heart and this beautiful capturing of moments, moments of time and, and that legacy. Johnny, I, I'm so thankful that we've gotten to share the time we have on set. And I really look forward to having opportunities to share more and to make you proud. Hey man, thanks a lot. It's been so good. I'm so glad you asked me to do it. I'm glad we got to do it. It's been fun talking to you. It's an absolute pleasure. And thanks for archiving all these conversations because they'll be so much more valuable in the future than they are right now. <laughs> well, I want everybody to see who everybody is and, and their amazing talents. So thanks, Johnny. All right, bro. I'll talk to you later. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. If you liked what you saw, or maybe you want to know more about the entertainment industry, check out some of our other episodes where we dive into other departments as I celebrate all the amazing people who make production possible. If you'd like to learn more about John Simmons' amazing work, check out his timeless photography or see some of his paintings. Visit www.johnsimmonsasc.com. If you'd like to be updated on Fish's Call Sheet, go ahead and subscribe or hit the bell below so you know right when we update new information.